a warm welcome to our viewers. We are happy to bring you yet another episode of Health Matters. It is rightly said, health is wealth. Nothing can compensate us in lieu of it. Today's episode deals with women's reproductive health and issues concerning health. Mary Pauline Lori summed it up for us beautifully when she said, there is pain in being a woman, but there is pride in it too. Through the woman, human life on this earth continues. She's an active and a much needed participant in procreation. With us in the studios today is a very eminent and experienced doctor with a string of qualifications to his credit and uh, a lot of experience in this particular field under his belt. He is a doctor of medicine and has a diploma in obstetrics and gynecology, as well as a diplomate of the National Board. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, London, fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh, fellow of the International College of Surgeons, USA. Introducing you to you, our doctor for today, Dr. Eugene De Silva. Thank you, Nirmala, for having me here today. And thank you for your kind words. Dr. Eugene, we know you're a very busy person. And uh, having come here in the studios with us, we want to get straight into it. So how many years have you been in this particular field? Well, I graduated in 1984 and I entered the speciality in 1986. So I would say around 37 years. Last experience. Well, yes, it's a lot of time. And yes, and I've worked in different hospitals across many parts of the world. And so, yes, I think it has given me a lot of experience. A woman undergoes different stages in her life cycle. We begin with the adolescent stage, then we have the adult woman, and finally, when she's at the end, ebbing, the fertility stage is at the end. You know? So, in, at different points of time, there would be uh, different issues which concern our health. Could you elaborate for us? different stages, like we begin with the adolescent, what could be the possible problems that a young woman could face at that stage? From the reproductive health perspective, we generally would classify women into three distinct periods of their life. That is puberty, adolescence and young women who could. Then we have women in the reproductive age group, like say from 20 to 45, 50. And then you would have women who are in the post-menopausal age group. Now, each of these groups of women have distinctively different, you know, health issues when it comes to their reproductive health. And they have distinctly different issues when it comes to their need or access to health care. So when we talk about adolescent girls, young girls, basically we're talking about girls who have achieved puberty and achieved menarche. When I say menarche, I mean a girl who's had her first menstrual period. When I say menopause, I mean a woman who's had her last menstrual period. And it is between menarche and menopause that we have the issues of reproductive health. When we talk about pubertal or adolescent girls, the common problems they manifest with is either they have a puberty and a menarche that is very early, or they have a menarche which is very late or they have periods that are very irregular or they have periods that are very painful or they may have other issues which are closely tied to their reproductive health such as obesity and acne and hair fall. All these things are the sort of complaints that young women come to us with. Now to try and understand each of those things. The average age that a girl has a first period is roughly about 11 years of age. Now, this has dropped in 70 years from 14 to 11. That's about three years drop. And this is probably reflected by the fact that people have better nutrition, better access to health and lesser communicable disease. And so women are getting fertile much earlier than they used to do, say, 70 years back. Now, if for any reason a girl has a period before the age of nine, we, we call this, you know, a precocious puberty. 
And if she has it after the age of 16, then we call this as a delayed menarche. And both these groups of girls have to be investigated for the reasons for the same, you see. Then we have girls who have, you know, irregular bleeding during the course of the disease. Now, I want to be very clear about this, that as the reproductive tract is maturing, we don't expect a girl who's had her first period to go on to have regular periods every month, you see. And so in the initial years, you know, she may have some degree of irregularity in the period, which is perfectly normal. So she may have a first period, then she may have a period of a few months, then she has another period. And slowly over a period of time, by the time she gets to 16, 17, regularizes. it's regularizing. So for most parents, please do not be upset if you feel that your daughter is not having periods in the early years of her life. The second problem that may occur is because of the irregularity of periods, they may bleed very heavily. And if this happens, again, there's no cause for concern. Okay. See your doctor. There are drugs available to reduce the amount of bleeding and to also help with the pain. So the common groups of symptoms in these girls is generally related to the, the sort of uh, periods, either the duration, the irregularity or the pain associated with this. Unfortunately, most of the causes of this are functional causes. There's rarely ever any abnormality in the girl and the treatment for this is generally symptomatic. The one growing problem in adolescent girls is obesity. And I think that is because of access to a large amount of packaged foods and, yes. you know, and the large consumption of additive sugars in our foods, preserved foods. And therefore, I think it is every parent's duty to make sure that your daughter is not only appropriate for her height and weight, but she's also healthy in a sense that she exercises regularly. You know, access to computers and mobile phones have meant that our children no longer go to play. Exercise. They just sit on the couch doing nothing but exercising their thumbs. And over a period of time, you do tend to pay a price for it. Because remember that obese adolescents will always be obese adults. Just like obese children will become obese adolescents, obese adolescents will become obese adults. There's nothing you can do afterwards. Well, it's far more difficult. It's not that you cannot do anything at a period of time, but the resolve you need, the time that you need to lose that weight is far greater. And very often young people don't have the energy or patience to see that. So they, they are easier, they feel happier just to put up with it than to try to lose it. So they also have uh, things like a white discharge and stuff like that. What could be the reason for this kind of... Uh... See, see, again, you know, in the early years, any discharge that a young girl has is probably due to the exposure to hormones that she was not used to before and now there is exposure to hormones. So there is secretions from the genital tract which are not there earlier, which may lead the young girl to believe that it is abnormal. This is perfectly normal. But you do get some infective discharges, notorious of which is candidial discharge, which is a fungus and it is very common in women. So, if it is a discharge that is generally associated with soreness and leaching, then it might be an idea to contact the gynecologist because the young girl may need some, some treatment for it. But this fortunately, again, though it is a common infection, it is an inocus, it's a simple in infection and it's treated very easily. What could be the reason they get it? This just See, basically what happens is that fungus is always present in our digestive tract. Okay. You see, and because the genital tract is very close proximity to the digestive tract, some amount of fungus can seep from the perianal areas into the vagina and they get this infection. Okay. Thank you. Um, what about we go to the next stage, the adult stage? The uh, next stage in a woman's life is the woman who is in the reproductive age group where her reproductive tract is matured. She has now settled down to having reg regular periods. She ovulates on a regular basis, she is fertile, she is capable of being pregnant, she is then going on to have this period for the next 25 years or so. And their problems are rather different. Women in this age group will come to us again with things related to sex, with requirement for contraception. They may have period problems, they may have associated uh, pathology to the genital tract such as fibroids, endometriosis, ovarian cysts. Or they may manifest with or come to us to seek help to have children. So infertility is also 
a growing sort of problem if we maintain the reproductive age group. So these are the conditions that would generally cause to gynecologists in women in this age group. Now, when we come to the post-reproductive age group, generally these are women who have had children. You see, they've stopped having their periods. Now they would approach us with problems such as symptoms of menopause. They may have problems with prolapse of the uterus. They may have problems with the urinary tract, urinary incontinence, you see, or in inability to empty the, the bladder. bladder completely. So there is a very different group of symptoms. And we generally call these post-reproductive symptoms because to some extent or the other, they are tied up to the reproductive years. So, Going back to the adult stage, uh, what happens uh, when a woman has this PCOS or the polycystic ovarian syndrome? What exactly happens there? Okay, I mean PCOS is not entirely exclusive to the adult woman. PCOS actually starts in the adolescence. Okay. Quite a lot of adolescents have PCOS. Now PCOS stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome. Okay, it used to be called polycystic ovarian disease before. Now the thing is that uh, what happens in PCOS is that the young woman, the young girl, does not ovulate on a regular basis. Now to understand this, <coughs> you have to understand that every month, there are about five follicles recruited on either side. So both ovaries will recruit some follicles, one of which will become what is called the dominant follicle or the egg. Mm. Now, women who have polycystic ovaries are sometimes unable to grow that dominant follicle, either because they have a microcellular defect in metabolism, they are very obese, or they have a predilection to diabetes. When they do this, no dominant egg grows, all the follicles grow together and it gives the ovary an appearance if you cut it off like cottage cheese, you know, all, all holes in the ovaries. And this appearance of the ovary was mistakenly called as polycystic ovaries. There are no cysts in the ovaries, the more appropriate term would have been polyfollicular ovaries. So it's very difficult to conceive if you have such a <coughs> condition. Yes, it is difficult to con conceive because you do not make a full full fledged egg and you don't ovulate. So, fortunately, there are medications now available to induce ovulation in such women. Okay. So, conception is not a great difficulty. Okay. An important thing to bear in mind is that polycystic ovaries and obesity are very, very closely tied. If you are going to be overweight, if you are obese, then it is very likely that you will develop polycystic ovaries. And again, it is a chicken and egg situation because once you develop polycystic ovaries, because you make a lot of male hormones in your body, you then put on extra weight. So at some point, you know, you have to break this cycle and the only way of doing that is by reducing the weight. Now we have another condition called as endometriosis. What is that? Now, <clears throat> see, when a woman has a menstrual period, she is actually shedding the lining of the womb. Yeah. Now, in most women, 90% of the blood comes to the outside. Yeah. But a small amount of the blood drops to the inside via the tubes. Okay. The fallopian tubes carry this blood into the inside of the patient's abdomen. Now this is not blood alone. This blood contains fragments of the lining of the womb which is called an endometrium. Okay. Now in most women, this blood carrying the endometrium that spreads on the inside is just reabsorbed and nothing happens. But in 10% of women, these lining take new roots on the outside okay. of the uterus and then they behave exactly like the lining inside. on the inside of the uterus. They respond to hormonal stimulation and just like when you are having a period you bleed from the womb, this lining bleeds on the outside. Now blood, if it is not in a blood vessel, is quite irritant. So this causes a dense inflammatory reaction which results in pain. It results in the woman having discomfort. It also leads to the organs sticking up together because yeah. of the fibrin that is in that blood. And over a period of time, the woman has dense adhesions, which then causes her problems with sex, it causes her problems with conceiving, it causes problems with the periods, and eventually, it may make a complete pelvic cripple out of her. So, and unfortunately, there's no stage-wise thing to say that, you know, one procedure, some women can develop very severe endometriosis very early, and some will develop mild endometriosis and stay that way for a long period of time. So the severity of disease 
is not entirely related to the severity of symptoms. So you can have mild endometriosis and have severe symptoms. You can have severe endometriosis, have no symptoms at all. Similarly, you may be young and have se severe endometriosis and you may be old and you may have mild endometriosis. So there's a lot yet to be understood of this condition, but it's a multifactorial condition. We do know that there are certain environmental toxins that can contribute to the development of endometriosis. So, I mean, you know, we are still studying. Studying. You see. Not perfectly clear how it happens. Yes, like, like many things in medicine, it is a constantly evolving knowledge that yes. comes about. So, again here, uh, I understand that sex would be painful in a woman having this condition. It could be very, very painful. And yes. secondly, fertility, it's conceiving is Yes, problem. the conception also is very difficult in women with endometriosis because it may physically cause alterations in the in the tubal morphology okay. or it may cause so much of pain that the woman may not want to have sex in the first place so it makes you know conception very very difficult okay. uh, we go to the menopause what are the problems that uh, women most commonly face during this period because it's very difficult after being fertile and the hormones helping you and you know you have different kinds of uh, benefits of the hormones now the hormones are ceasing there's a cessation like so we are coming to this stage where the woman will finally not have any of these uh, uh, hormones that would uh, make her have her period so what is the uh, what do you call the body's understanding of it and how does it how does the woman respond or what does she face during this time uh, see i i think that uh, uh, the menopause most certainly you know is a reflection of aging okay. and is certainly a reflection of the change in life. Yeah. How menopause is received by women depends a lot culturally. You know, in Western societies, probably it is a doomsday scenario. You say, oh, now I'm grown old and things like that. And, you know, the children are grown up and I no longer feel like a woman and things like that. Historically in India, women actually look forward to menopause. Because they're free at because last. Because they're free at last. <laughs> you know, they're free from having more children. You know. Okay. And uh, what is more important is that they're then seen as elders in society. So I think that Indian women mm -hmm. do not look at menopause with the same negative attitude as in many other cultures. But nonetheless, they still have symptoms of hormone deprivation. And many, many times these symptoms can be rather distressing. For example, so you have to understand, first of all, that the effects of sex hormones are not entirely on the genital tract or the urinary tract alone. They have some significant benefits on the heart. They've got significant benefits on the brain. They've got significant benefits on the blood coagulation mechanisms. So when there is hormonal deprivation, the woman would certainly have you know, problems with regard to her genital, genital tract. Okay. She would have problems with the urinary tract and she would have generalized symptoms. Okay. Now, most times the common symptoms of menopause are they tend to feel suddenly very hot mm -hmm. and then have a chill and feel cold and then break out into a sweat. Mm -hmm. This is what we call as, you know, cold sweats, mm -hmm. you see. Then there is certainly mood irritability, swings. you yeah. see. They have mood swings, they're predisposed to depressive episodes Okay, they can have migraines. So there are these symptoms. Some women manifest with bloating, they manifest with, you know, irregularity in their bowels and things like that, which over a period of time would certainly settle Set down. When it comes to definitive sort of symptoms with regard to hormone depreciation, uh, deprivation in the genital tract, these women have a lower sex drive. Okay. If they have sex, it is rather painful. They have vaginal dryness. Mm -hmm. Okay. They are more predisposed to picking up infections because, you know, the lining of the vagina and the urinary tract is much thinner. So they have frequent urinary tract infections. Almost invariably, every time they have intercourse, they will probably manifest with some, some degree of an infection. And all in all, you know, it deprives them of what I would believe, the same degree of a healthy sexual lifestyle that they were used to. Fortunately, today we have very safe, Remedy is available both in the form of official hormone replacement therapy. You also have some, you know, plant estrogens which are used effectively without the same risks of, you know, synthetic hormone replacement therapy. 
And of course, there's a lot of lifestyle changes that help a woman to cope with her symptoms of menopause better. Thank you. Um, you have a vast experience in sur surgeries because you're a surgeon too. So could you tell us some of the types of surgeries that you do and mention also any rare things that you've done? No, the thing is that, you know, as a gynecologist, you see, you, you do a whole range of surgeries. In addition, we are fortunate that we, we have a dual qualification in obstetrics also. So we deal with a lot of pregnant women. Mm -hmm. Now with, with pregnant women, we do surgeries, you know, with regard to abortions, so that is a miscarriage. We do surgeries with regard to ectopic pregnancies, that is when, you know, a pregnancy is not located in the uterus, but it's located either in the fallopian tube or anywhere outside the uterus. Why would that happen? Any reason? Well, there are numerous reasons again for it, but the commonest reason is if there is tubal disease. Okay. You see, so if there has been a previous infection okay. and the tube is not entirely blocked but partially blocked, then it is possible that the sperm can slip inside, fertilize the egg, but then the block is large enough to prevent the fertilized egg from coming into the uterus. So that is the commonest cause for this. So previous tubal infection is probably the commonest cause for an ectopic pregnancy. So as I was saying, then we do cesarean sections, you see. Gynecologically, we do operations, or so I do operations with regard to ovarian pathology, ovarian cysts, ovarian tumors. When it comes to the uterus, we do a hysterectomy for a whole range of, you know, reproductive tract problems. We remove fibroids, which is myomectomies. We do operations for urinary incontinence. We do operations to repair prolapses okay. which, and put back things in place because the prolapse is nothing more than a hernia that is occurring through the genital tract. So there's a whole range of operations okay. that I do. And yes, now when it comes to the weird and wonderful operations, of course, we all as surgeons would have done some weird and wonderful things in our life, you see. And generally, when you work 37 years, you've done so many weird and wonderful okay. things that if you ask to say, tell me okay. one thing that is. Okay. So the only thing I do remember, you know, quite clearly was a young woman who had come to go on a holiday and as she was leaving the airport, her son left her hand and started running across the road. Okay. So in an effort to, to sort of grab him before he got to the road, she ran after him and she bumped into the corner of a trolley, an airport trolley. Okay, you see. It, hit it just hit her on her crotch, you see. And at that time she had just a slight, you know, bit of pain. And in the 45 minutes it took her to reach from the airport, she had a huge clot that had formed in her vulva and she just collapsed in the taxi. So she was rushed to the hospital and we had to take her for an emergency drainage. Then there was another time where there was a woman who went to watch a movie and at the interval she went to the toilet. There was nobody with her. She had ruptured an ectopic pregnancy. She collapsed in the toilet and they found her only you know, an hour later, once the movie was over and the friends she discovered bled. she hadn't come down. She had bled on the inside. So again, like, you know, by the time she brought us, they brought her to us, she was very, very critical. So you tend to remember things like that rather than Chale. cases that have been so. Okay. Um, what is the possible cause of a fibroid form? I wish I knew that answer okay. because I would be in <laughs> because every year. So so no. <laughs> <laughs> so you hear it so commonly that. No, fi you know. fibroids are actually a fairly common disorder of the uterus. Okay. And it has a multifactorial basis to it. Okay. So there is no single cause. There are many things that contribute to a fibroid. <laughs> now, your race contributes in a very large way. It's a well known fact that black women tend to have fibroids far more commonly than white okay. women. Okay. And, you know, Asians would probably lie somewhere in the middle. We do know that exposure to estrogens increases the risk of you developing fibroids. And there could be some sort of genetic basis to it too, which we have not understood very well. But there is no single cause for fibroids. There are some women who are more predisposed to it. There are others who are less predisposed to it. Yes, would uh, uh, would uh, using uh, these contraceptives be a contributing factor to it? Yeah. It would certainly contribute to the growth of the fibroids. So now whether it actually causes fibroids de novo or, you know, on their own they cause fibroids, there is no strong evidence of that. But if you did have a small fibroid and you took the contraceptive pill, then it's very likely 
under the influence of these hormones, the fibroid is going to grow faster and quicker and grow to a much larger size than it may have on its own. Um, you are such a busy person because it took me so long to get you here in the studios. I know something or the other always there to attend to. So with all this business of your life and all this work that you do, how do you uh, de-stress or how does Jack play as we say? See, I mean, you know, when when you want to do something in life, you always have to make the time for it. Yeah. So you either stretch the day yeah. to fit your work yeah. or stretch the work to fit your day. So what do you do? We, of course, have to stretch the day to fit our work. So when you want to de-stress, you pick on some things that make you happy, that don't remind you of your day-to-day -day work. For me, that hobby is really to take up old houses, and then I sit and renovate them. I so see. it takes me years to complete it, but it provides me the necessary sort of distraction from my regular work. It refreshes so you. I actually go on site physically on Saturdays and Sundays, but then the rest of the week in my spare time, I'm sitting and planning things out. You know, what sort of windows I'm going to have, what sort of doors I'm going to have, you know, what sort of tiles I'm going to have, what sort of layout I'm going to have. So that keeps me occupied, you know, and it's been keeping me occupied for the last 10 years actually. In this 10 year time, I've managed to How many know, houses? renovate three houses. Wow. Now, so do it, do you, sorry to interrupt you, do you do it on a professional basis or this is for yourself alone or anybody can ask you uh, services in this area? Please? So far, I've been doing it for myself rather selfishly. <laughs> so now you're open to helping anyone who appreciates Sure, if you want to have this, I can give you the ideas, right. I can give you the, the uh, pointing towards the workmen who do that sort of work because I've aggregated quite a lot of experience in acquiring this sort of talented tradesman base, you know, so I use them all the time. So yes, that's how I de-stress. Thank you very much for coming here. Thank you for having me and, over. And uh, helping our viewers understand all about, you know, we could have discussed much more, but our time has run out, unfortunately. But I still thank you and uh, say God bless you in all the work. Thank you, you and God bless you too.